Hey guys, Johnny Quirk back once again here to support your entrepreneurial journey. Okay, cool. So today I'm delighted to say that on the show we have Roger Davies from Revolutionary Health and Fitness. Roger, great to have you here. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having me on, Johnny. No problem at all, man. And welcome to the show. So I'm really happy to have you here today because, you know, we are our first health and fitness entrepreneur that we've actually had on the Go Solo show. And I think for many entrepreneurs, health and fitness is such a major thing to get right. So first off, maybe in your own words, could you describe your business? Tell us exactly what it is that you do. Yeah, so, I mean, my work's split between in-person and online, kind of health coaching. So a lot of people think diet and exercise immediately, but it goes really beyond that. So, you know, sleep management, stress management, purpose, all those kinds of things as well. You know, time outdoors, time in nature, sunlight, et cetera. So it's really kind of a holistic approach to health and wellness. So it's the kind of full package is obviously what you offer then. Yeah. I mean, with some of it, the exercise might give kind of the, the, the foot in the door for me. So someone might come to me and say, I want to you know, lose weight and tone up. And they might just think, oh, I just want to do so many you know, sessions of exercise a week. And then I'll have to try maybe and chip away at little bits where I can say, listen, if you were to do this, it would make your life better in this way. Yep. Or it would accelerate your results in that way. Okay, great. And in essence, like, what is the service or product that you sell? I mean, who are your actual customers? And what's that USP that sets you apart from your competitors as well? So I guess lockdown probably changed things for me a little bit in that I used to run group sessions. And I was a big fan of the group sessions in that it's, it's got that community feel to it. Generally, people don't like exercise. People, you know, exercise is a modern invention for the fact that we're not doing the things that we should do. Yeah. Um, so the group sessions were, were great for that. But obviously, lockdown put an end to the group sessions. I did Zoom group sessions. It really wasn't for me. You know, it, it just its people jumping around in the living room. It gets a bit boring. <laughs> it does. Um, so I use an app that I've got, Healthier, Healthier Happier Humans where I can deliver things like meal plans, habits, and all that kind of stuff, workouts, et cetera, and check in with clients regularly. Um, and I guess it's shifted somewhat in that I do have, I do have one or two kind of entrepreneurs, uh, people who manage uh, franchises like phone shops, mm. um, and then obviously work from home parents uh, yeah. and make up a bulk of it as well. And in terms of those kind of clients, to drill down a little bit deep into that, you know, like, you say they come to you for kind of exercise in the first place. That's the kind of gateway, I guess, coming through to you. A lot of the time, yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people have been sold this idea that they need to flog themselves in the gym to get any kind of result. And that obviously you've heard they, they eat less, move more kind of thing. And it's, it's yeah. true that species, we are moving less. And if you look at, say, modern hunter-gatherer societies, they tend to move more frequently throughout the day, low intensities, etc. Yeah. Um, but the idea that you have to be in the gym for five hours a week is is misguided. A lot of movement is low intensity type of stuff. Wow, um, you're so, telling me I don't need to be in the gym for five hours. Like, t t tell me what the secret is then. So a lot of it is low intensity. A lot of it is walking. A lot of it is getting out. About like you mentioned, you've been on that big hike. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you did something like that, say once a week, or or maybe even a couple of times a week, but then you your bulk of it is just daily. Are you getting over ten thousand steps a day? That's yep. really worth it. Um, and yeah I think people view exercise as punishment as well and I think that's you know people view the vegetables and fruits as a punishment and I yeah. think that's you're off to a bad start there yeah so it's kind of almost bringing back into focus what those kind of key fundamentals are for a healthy fit, fit life yeah and I guess mindset and in, in, with being an entrepreneur you know mindset's a critical component in that isn't it? it's the foundation basically yeah. and it's the foundation with kind of health and wellness is you want to be you want to be thinking i want to fuel my body for, for the best performance you know i want to exercise because i want to be able to move when i'm 60 and 70 years old i want to be able to play with my grandkids that kind of thing yeah. rather than if i flog myself in the gym i'll get such and such a result yeah i can understand so it's almost like that sustainable exercise like something which people can actually have throughout their whole life but it's not just like, you know, yeah. it's really intense. It's something which actually is manageable on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and I guess that kind of brings brings us to what you what you actually asked me, which is the unique selling. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Bringing me back on track. 
Um, yeah, the unique selling point is kind of that kind of health and wellness for people who, who don't like exercise, I guess. You know, for me, it was about fun and play and purpose as well. Mm. You know, I a lot of my exercise has a purpose to it. So we do stuff like the, obviously, the gymnastic rings and the handstand stuff. That is just fun. Um, I play record with my daughter regularly. But then things like the self-defense sessions that we do and the sessions that we do that are kind of like like a kind of basic parkour, it's it's all about being functional, being able to, which is an overdone word, but basically being able to move through life well. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, and and that, has, that has purpose for me. Biceps yeah. girls have too much purpose for me. Yeah, so it's more about, like you said, it's kind of general fitness as opposed to i got to look great for the beach. I mean, I guess that's probably a knock-on benefit which comes from that, you know, over time and people start to get more into exercise, but it's not a, a scary approach to somebody if they're coming completely unfit or something and, and really need to start from somewhere. Yeah, I mean, things like, you know, can you jump over a gap that's, say, a metre or something like that? Can you climb over a fence that's, say, two metres high? Can you crawl underneath obstacles? Can you carry someone a certain distance? Those are the kinds of things that you would need to do. Say if like your car breaks down in the middle of nowhere or you have to outrun someone or you have to climb over. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's No one cares how much you can bicep curl when you're doing those kind of things. Yeah, it's true. And I guess, you know, some of this stuff has been lost over the years. Like you said, you know, as human beings, we used to try and take on an awful lot of kind of extra calories because we'd be doing a lot of manual jobs you know, I yeah. think, you know, we can say this being in Manchester, you know, like pies and stuff were created because obviously they were you know, mutually dense. You know, they were. Yeah. Well, it's true. Yeah, exactly. It fuels the industrial revolution because it was strenuous work. Whereas now, yeah. actually, the flip side is we actually have all of these calories in in our, uh, you know, in, in our diets and, and an easy access and cheap. But it's that kind of yeah. sedentary lifestyle which has taken over, um, which, again, I guess the, the balance is out of kilter. Um, in terms of the actual product you sell, so obviously I know that you said you've moved away and things have changed slightly over the last, say, like 12 months. Are you selling, you know, do your clients have like one-off sessions with you? It seems to me like you're building a relationship with them. It's like you're taking them on a journey. Yeah, so the, the, the package is – so. Say in, where, in Wigan, where I'm based, and, and you know, probably broadly in the Greater Manchester area, you're probably looking at maybe thirty pounds for a session with a personal trainer, maybe mm. up to about forty pounds. Obviously, it goes places like London, it's probably double that. Yeah. Um, well, say you come to me and you say, right, I want, I want a PT. Can, can you give me a PT? It's like, well, I'll give you a PT. You do one session with me. You've just spent thirty pounds. Then yeah. when will I see you again? You know, yeah. and if I see you in two weeks, you might do it again. And if I see you two times in one week, and then you know, by the end of say six months, you might have spent, I don't know, you might have spent a good five or six hundred pounds with me, and you'll have zero results because yeah. you just turn to the occasional workout. Um, whereas I kind of I don't want to give someone just workouts, I don't want to just give someone just meal plans. Like you say, I want to take them on a journey. So yeah. the minimum package is eight weeks. Um, and then we, we work from there. Eight weeks is a good time to start to see some changes in people's behavior. You know, it's it's really behavior change coaching is what i'm aiming for rather than you know and lifestyle change rather yeah. than just diet and exercise and i think that's really cool because we'll dig into that a little bit deeper and later in the show you know when we talk really about how you fostered this community and, and how you build that i think that ties in probably very well in terms of the eight week course and then maybe some of the alumni that you have obviously from that as well but what gave you the idea for this? I mean, you know, the name of the company is Revolutionary Health and Fitness. So it is something different. It's like you said, it's completely different from the traditional personal trainer model. But what really gave you that kind of idea and the passion to start this? So, I mean, you knew me before. You knew me before I kind of embarked on this journey, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, in fact, that was going to be my follow-up question, which was it was quite a lifestyle change. But if that encompasses two questions, go for it, Roger. I just ruined it for you. Yeah. <laughs> the flow is led by you, so 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 go for that. So obviously, yeah, I was interested in music. I wanted to be in a band, you know, and it's it's it, it's not totally unrealistic to want to make a living out of music, but it's a pretty hard lifestyle, and yeah. it's gonna probably gonna grind you into the ground, and you know, you're gonna you're gonna have a pretty horrible kind of uh, relationship with say food, sleep, and all that kind of stuff, and. You know, if you get if you get kids along the way, that's going to be difficult. Yeah. And I guess 
back then I wasn't really thinking that way, but the the kind of culture I got involved in in Wigan, the rock and roll lifestyle, you know, it was drink, drugs, late nights, no sleep, all, basically all the worst kind of things. And I grew up, I hated sports. I didn't take part in any sports, you know. I was always hanging around with the fat kids so I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> I always didn't like any sports still. Um, apart from the, the athletic type sports, I was, I was crap at them. But it yeah. was stuff, you know, you got to do high jumps and stuff. They seemed yeah. like fun. Um, but yeah, I guess I just wasn't interested in that stuff. Obviously, I followed the music career path. I got involved in the rock and roll lifestyle, which ultimately takes its toll. Mm. Hit the age of about, obviously, as, as, I, as I met you, I was setting up the recording studio and rehearsal rooms and realised quite quickly that there's no money in that, really, and no satisfaction, you know, and it, it takes a lot of your time. Um, and I guess when I looked around me at, at friends and family, you know, I was 26, 27 years old, and I was getting things like pain in my leg, which was a circulation problem related to poor diet, lack of activity and smoking. Yeah. Uh, and I was looking at people around me who were suffering mental health problems. Um, they were suffering, like, they had the, the onset of, like, type 2 diabetes and things like that. And when I looked at it, I was kind of like, most people think these things are divorced from the lifestyle. Like, oh, I get to 30, I get to 40, and I start to fall apart. And I start taking one medication, then another, then another. And I started thinking, this sounds like an excuse. And then you look at the, you know, global population. You look at uh, groups in, say, like Okinawa, Japan. Yeah. You look at, say, the Inuits and people. And you look at their health and you look at where people live to, say, past 100. Um, and where they don't have, you know, they don't have major problems with coronary heart disease or type 2 diabetes or arthritis and stuff. And you start to see a common theme where they don't eat a lot of processed food, they yeah. move regularly, they have connection with other people, they spend a lot of time outdoors. Mm. And it's a case of, well, this isn't, you know, it, it's, people take it for granted that your health fails you as you grow older. And I was like, this just isn't the case. It's a direct result of the lifestyle. And yeah. when I was looking around me, I was like, I'm already feeling some aches and pains at 27. You know, I should be in my prime. Yeah. And so I started thinking, you know, there's, there's things that I can change. So then I started working on my diet, started exercising more, uh, noticed the change in myself and in my, in my mental health as well. Because uh, obviously drink, drugs and late nights don't do your mental health any favours. No. And, and, the and um, noticed the change in my mental health and then in my physical health. And then it was turning up at parties and seeing people I'd not seen for, say, a year or so. And they'd comment and they'd say, oh, you're looking so well. You know, your skin looks great. You know, you're looking like you've lost weight, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how have you done this, basically? And I just found that so much of my time was spent giving out advice to people. I was like, why don't I actually make a career out of it? <laughs> so you were there at a party saying, I could talk to you, but it'll be £10 per hour. So, you know, make sure you fill up my pocket with that as well. <laughs> well, that's that's the weird thing, because you, you mentioned that. And um, a lot of people say to me, they say, like, why? Because I'll stop and I'll talk to people for half an hour or so. And they'll say, why aren't you charging me for this? And I'll say, well, if I if I turn around and I say, listen, I'm not going to, you know, st I'll start the meter here or right. I'm not going to give you this free advice. It's like, well, what if I've, what if my um, reluctance to give someone advice leads to them having further health problems? It's like, I don't want to, I don't want that guilt. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. If I can have it for free, then I will. Uh, exactly. And that's brilliant because, I mean, you know, not only from a point of view is that, if they start to get, you know, have a healthier lifestyle, they may be interested in your business down the line anyway. But actually, yeah. I think the more people you help generally, then that's going to have to be better for society anyway. So you're at a point where, you know, these guys might talk about you and go, oh, I learned from Roger or whatever, introduce future customers. But just generally on a, on a holistic way, you're helping more and more people as well. Yeah, yeah. And you write some of those people like two or three years later, after I've given, say, hours of free advice, they yeah. come back and say, actually, I'd like to work with you. And then do they say, can I have 50% off as well? You know, <laughs> yeah, but you're like, no, you can pay me for the original advice. Yeah, I'll charge you 50% extra for the original advice. <laughs> exactly. So I think this is really exciting because I think from a lot of the people we've had on the Go Solo show, you know, a lot of it has been about how they have almost not necessarily stumbled into a new career, but they've kind of found that they are following their passions. You know, they've maybe had other jobs or they've had other businesses, the likes before. But it sounds like you actually could see a real problem in your life that you solved. And I guess 
if you wanted to you know solve that problem for yourself you became an avid reader about ways that you could make yourself better and you just want to kind of share this with the world as well yeah and i guess you know um it a, a little look into my psychology at the time was that i externalized a lot of problems and blamed say the world the government you know you, you blame all these externalities and it's like oh because of the government you know i'm yeah. i'm so poor or because of my upbringing I can't do this. I never had this opportunity. And it was like, well, I can take control of something here mm. that has pretty, pretty definite outcomes. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah. not, you can, you can look at the data and you can say, yes, if I do this, I'm going to get this kind of result if I'm fairly consistent with it. So you can say that and it's like, well, I've got some control there over the direction of my life. So yeah. that, I guess, it kind of cut out the bullshit that I was telling myself of like, you know, I'm a victim of circumstance. Yeah, you can take control of your own destiny, really, and have some things which you can control. I mean, we talk a lot about this, you know, in terms of there are some things you control in life and some can't. But I guess when you set the things away that you can't control, then it's time to find some kind of things you can control in life as well. Yeah, definitely. And in terms of that, you know, I always ask this question of our guests on this show, but, you know, what is your kind of background? You know, do you come from an entrepreneurial family? You know, like, you know, was was starting up a business in the blood? You know, like, like tell me, like, you know, what made you actually, because obviously this isn't your first rodeo in terms of setting up your business. You know, like, like you said, you've had another one, maybe another one in the past before as well. What, what kind of makes you want to want to do that? <laughs> Problems with authority. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like taking orders. Yeah, um, that's true. Essentially, yeah, problems with authority and not like taking orders. So yeah. never liked having a boss, you know, yeah. and they were always crap jobs that I worked. But I, I realized at the time that I worked crap jobs to pay the bills, you know, and it, I would I would put the hours in when yeah. I saw something at the end of it. You know, I, when I was doing my uh, A-levels, which I didn't do particularly well at, I um, I was working at McDonald's four yeah. or five nights a week. So it was go to, go to sixth form. And then go straight from six farm to McDonald's, work till midnight, and then repeat four days a week. Um, yeah. And I did that at the time to go to Austria on a skiing holiday. Yeah, I was saving that and then saving up for a car, and then you know, pay for drive lessons, all that stuff. So there was a goal, so I could put the work in when I needed to. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as entrepreneurial background, you no, know, my mum. I mean, my mum took on quite a few jobs, so I guess I knew the value of hard work. Uh, my mum and dad split up when I was about 10, 11 ish. Right. Okay. Uh, my mum was was doing the bulk of the earning then. Yeah. Probably the bulk of the earning before that, to be honest. I don't think my dad worked that much. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, so there was no real entrepreneurial kind of spirit there. It, it was kind of, I don't want to take orders from other people. Yeah. Uh, there's other ways I can do things. I want to be my own boss. And then I guess yeah. the dream, the dream when you're into music is I'll run a recording studio or rehearsal rooms. That seems like, you know that that seems like the idyllic kind of teen film thing yeah and, and it was I, vi I visited the studios in the past and it was like you know very very off the radar but you know all sorts of transients kind of coming through as well and I guess you're exposed <laughs> to that you know on, on a daily basis you don't know what's around the next corner yeah definitely definitely but I, I think that's interesting because I mean there is you know we, again I don't think there is any linear road to success you know I know people who excelled at A-levels university aren't doing so well now, you know, in terms of what their career projections were. I know some people who quit at GCSEs, who've gone on to have an amazing career or set up their own job. So I think like you're saying, you know, you understand the value of hard work and work when you need to, but you've got to have some kind of deeper motivation beyond cash. Would that be true? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think also I'm pretty, going back to that other point, I'm, I'm pretty good at flogging a dead horse and being <laughs> resilient as well. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. I think, to be to go into business for yourself, you've got to be extremely resilient. You've got to have your door, the door slammed in your face quite a few times. You know, just keep going. And I guess probably the final question before we move on to some of like you know some of your advice in terms of how you've grown your business is, you know, I imagine this wasn't something which became an overnight success for you. You know, you have had to work at it and you have had to put the time in. How, how did you build up resilience in those early days to, to stay on course with revolutionary and, and obviously, you know, just keep going, even obviously you had to pivot through COVID. I'm interested to know like how you've constantly kept on track and you basically keep motivated every day to say, this is the number one thing you should be spending your time on in life. Um, so I guess 
obviously living in living in a first world country makes it a little bit easier, doesn't it? Living in you know living in a, a country where there was government assistance, you know, particularly mm. with. I mean, obviously, I did that course with you where we got I got some financial assistance from uh, Manchester Uni, and then I also got some financial assistance, which was a loan actually I had to pay back, which was from the Prince's Trust, and that was from my first business. Um, and then coming into business with with Revolutionary, it was a case of um, I don't think I got any financial assistance apart from uh, at the time it was job seekers basically. So working for myself and just getting a little bit to kind of pay for food each week. Yeah. Obviously, if I had that the worry of, of, of earning money for food as well. Then maybe I wouldn't have succeeded. Yeah, the welfare, the welfare state to some degree did kind of keep me going in those early days. You know, yeah. back when I was charging £10 for a PT session, say six years ago or whatever, yeah. um, and people didn't get any results. <laughs> well, yeah, I know, but it happens a lot though, doesn't it? I mean, you know, you've got to have some kind of way, you know, like in terms of easing yourself into it and having that kind of room to experiment. I mean... To... You'll find that with most entrepreneurs, they'll talk about the day that they had like £2 in the bank account or, do you know what I mean? When I had those practice rooms, I got rid of my uh, apartments at the time because... I thought the way I was going to get kind of screwed with with benefits when I was running that uh, the practice rooms, I thought that I need to be basically living at the practice rooms to cut my costs. So I spent six months living, basically sleeping on the floor in a practice room while we're in the business, getting showers at friends' houses in the gym and stuff. You know, yeah. just cutting my costs wherever I could. Uh, I remember I mean, visiting you there, Roger. I remember there being uh, dishes in the sink in the in in the kind of like the small on bathroom there, but you know. You did what you needed to do at the time. You know, you like you said, cut costs to keep that running and made sure that obviously, you know, any spare cash was going into your dream, you know, to, to run the recording studios. Yeah. Yeah. And I took on uh, second jobs as well at times and then got someone to watch the studio while I did, you know, PPI jobs and stuff. And even when I've been running uh, Revolutionary in the early days, so this was about three or four years ago, I signed up to a clinical trial in Manchester and yeah. had both up injected in my foot. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, Botox, it, there's a misconception about Botox. It doesn't smooth out. You know, I didn't I didn't end up with a really beautiful foot. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, just a, it's an anti-spasticity treatment. So if you have a spastic muscle, you yeah. inject it, it releases the muscle. So for this clinical trial, it was a few thousand pounds for like five or six days' work, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're getting, you're getting a, a, an experimental drug injected into your foot. <laughs> Sign me up, Roger. I don't mind side hustles myself. If you ever hear about many of these, just give me a shout. I'm, I'm more than happy to uh, uh, take the injection for that. So, Okay, cool. So I think this is all really good because, look, there is no one way to success. I mean, obviously, things are going really well for you now, which is brilliant. You know, you've got a really strong identity. You've got a community. You know, you've got regular customers, which is amazing. But there are many ways to, you know, many, many roads lead to Rome, if you will do. So I think taking on bits of work here or there, side hustles and building up in a sustainable way is so, so important. But in this section, we always dig in on this show, like some of your top tips for other entrepreneurs, really, about how they've done that. So, you know, you've built up a pretty impressive, let's call it social media following, community, content base, you know, and you're very, very active in terms of sharing really amazing content really like very usable and valuable content to your followers i'm just interested you give some tips on how people who you know in in any type of business maybe could start working on a content strategy and again maybe some tips on how you go about running your community as well so yeah obviously i've got the free the free facebook group um with my free facebook group i've looked at other fitness professionals and I've seen what they've done and I've incorporated some of what they've done. I've also outsourced little bits of my content as well. So Who do you outsource other... that to? So there is um, Fit Pro Essentials and that's, um, what's her name? Alicia Streger, if I've pronounced okay. that right. Fit Pro Essentials. And basically you can buy content packages from her and then you just kind of rebrand it a little bit, tweak the language so it's your own because there's certain words that I'm not going to, you, you know what I mean? It's, she's American. Yeah. Um, the phrases and things like that I want to I want to change. Um, so you put it in your own voice basically, and then put it out there. There's also obviously I've created my own content and and a lot of that from scratch, like videos. And the ideas I guess for some of that would be, you know, ask questions. There's no better 
kind of you'll get no better engagement on Facebook than asking a question. So if you put a question out there, like I did the other day, which was, you know, how do you feel about the gyms reopening on the 12th of April? You know, and people come on there. Um, it's a case of everyone wants to have their voice heard. So if yeah. you can put a question out there, people will jump on it straight away. But not only that, you've basically got your market research done for you there. Because mm. if they feel, say, say a few people jump on there and say they're feeling anxious, then those people might be in the market for home workout plans. Some people might jump on there and say, I'm going back to the gym, but I've been going to the gym for eight years and I've never had any results. So those people might want to plan for when they go back to the gym. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, but even if, even if none of those people on there are, are potential customers, you could just talk to them as human beings. You know what I mean? You could offer them some advice and you can, you can point them in the right direction anyway. And do you see this as like, you know, I mean, again, you're playing the long game. I guess it serves many purposes running an online community. You know, it keeps your current customers engaged, maybe some alumni, maybe some people who are interested in complete newbies. Do you see yeah. it as lead gen? I mean, in terms of when you are looking for new customers, you know, where I guess you asked the question, how did you find out about me? You know, like, where are those, where are those new customers coming from? Um, yeah, I'd, well, they're coming from Facebook nine times out of ten. Right. Uh, and then referrals as well. I do get referrals from current clients. Um, but yeah, mostly Facebook. I mean, I've played about with Instagram and Instagram is considered better for the fitness world, isn't it? But mm. it's just, and I prefer Instagram in some ways, but for me, I haven't had the following on Instagram and I haven't had any, any leads through Instagram. So it's something I've kind of just let atrophy while it, you know, it wasn't generating the business. Yeah. And again, this is something we talk about with our entrepreneurs, you know, especially if you're a solo entrepreneur like yourself, you, there's only so many things you can do and so only so many platforms you can manage to, to make a success of it as well. Facebook obviously seems to be working really well for yourself. Um, and it kind of leads me on maybe to the next question because, you know, I'm interested to know the relationships you have with your clients, you know, like yeah. how do you approach, you know, the first time they get in contact with you, how do you approach like, you know, the follow up with them? How do you convert them into a customer? How do you keep them, you know, motivated to come back? I'm just interested in what that flow is like. So in terms of maybe generating lead gen or actually, you know, how you uh, start a relationship with a customer to, you know, to turn them into a, a regular client of yourself. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the ways is that if someone comments on a post and I've been, I've been quite sloppy, I guess, since for the past, I'd say six to six to eight months, I've been quite sloppy and following up with a lot of potential leads. I did a, a bit of a challenge because I'm a member of a few fitness groups, fitness professionals, and I did a challenge in one of them where we were going through like all our potential leads and there were other people in the group. It was only a five day challenge and we were just counting up all our potential leads by going back through, you know, text and Facebook message and everything. And people were, other fitness professionals were popping up and saying, oh yeah, I've got 10 leads here. I've got eight leads here. And I was like, I've got 52 and I've not stopped counting. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I've yeah. For say, say five or six months. And I felt like I dropped the ball on a lot of that. And part of that was because I had somewhat enough work coming in. Mm. But part of that is also, you know, global pandemic, slightly shut down, kind of, do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it kind of let some stuff go because I realised that for my own well-being, getting out outdoors and exercising and spending time with friends and family it was crucial. And maybe following up on every lead wasn't the best use of my time this year, do you know what I mean? Yeah, um, but that's one way is that um, if someone comments on a Facebook post, then I can send them a message saying, thanks for commenting on it, blah, blah, blah. And then I can, if they're not a member of the free group, I can say, if you want to join our free group, here you go. Um, and then I can ask them some questions, say, you know, what is it you're struggling with or what is it you're interested in doing? And I can point them in the direction because you don't want to, you know, I'm not going to turn up and go, by the way, buy my program. <laughs> yeah 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 that that's kind of i guess getting involved too early you know in a traditional sales funnel if you will do to take it ultra businessy you want to move them through each stage fairly naturally yeah so you might you might know the uh the jargon for it yeah with your sales funnel and nurturing yeah. leads and yeah. you kind of want to give people a lot of free stuff and then you know if, like like i said before look, i could give people unlimited free stuff and they'll never do anything with it but i could give people unlimited free stuff and they might actually make the changes. And, and I've had people come back to me a year or two later and say, I did this, I did that. And, you know, I've lost 10 pounds. I feel yeah. so much better. 
and I never paid you for it. You know, yeah, that's yeah. fine. That's fine. But, um, you know, if I do that, there might come a point in someone's journey where they end up saying, oh, can I buy this resource off you? And it might just be like a recipe book or something or yeah. an app subscription. And it might be minimal. It, they might pay like a, a tenner a month or whatever it is. And then they might, they might get the results from that and that could be fine. But they might not, and then they might say, "Actually, I need some accountability. I need you to phone me every other day. I need you to give me this, give me that." See what I mean? Yeah. So then you'd have kind of different tiers of service as well. But I think this comes down as well to consistency as well. You know, like it's the moment when you turn off your channels, so to speak, or you think, "Oh, this isn't working for me." That's like the most dangerous thing because I think having this consistency is so important. You know, I used to find this when I worked for Yelp. I would ask people who would maybe come on and be maybe some of our, you know, most active, uh, you know, Yelpers, if you will do. And I'd be like, well, you know, and they'd be like, oh, I've been using Yelp for two or three years. You know, I love that review you did at that burger bar years ago. Or I heard from a friend about a party you did a long time ago. I'd be like, really? Well, why have you been kind of lurking in the shadows, if you will? And they'd be like, well, it just wasn't the natural right time for me to get involved. But I've really been enjoying the content. I've been really enjoying the kind of ambient community stuff you're putting on social seems like it's the right time for me to join. So I think from a customer point of view, there's many times when they want to get involved. And again, if they maybe think that you've shut up shop because you're not being consistent with your content, then yeah, you know, they may not come to you then. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Consistency is key. And consistency is key with any of the lifestyle changes and healthier habits. Do you know what I mean? In- yeah. Intensity. Consistency beats intensity. You know, and I've, I, I have had phases where I've gone the intensity route and gone to what a lot of the professionals say is like you do three posts a day, basically. So you might have a morning one, early afternoon, and then early evening one. Um, and it's just a bit much that. It's a bit much for me. I don't want to be on social media that much. Yeah. Um, that, that's the constant battle I have is that I don't like social media. <laughs> I, I think that's it. The, the, the tide is changing, isn't it, really? I think in terms of that relationship we have with social and, you know, it's interesting, like you said, I think from yours is, is specific in terms of Facebook, because actually, you know, so many people obviously move away from Facebook. But for you, obviously, like you said, it generates results. And that's the most important thing is identifying those channels that actually do kind of bring you the results that, that obviously you want. Well, no, I just... Carol? I've had Facebook adverts and have zero business from them, you know, yeah. I probably only wasted about two or three hundred pounds on Facebook advert at, you know, times like Christmas time and stuff like that. And it generated almost zero business from it. And I don't really know what I'm doing with it, I guess. Um, but you kind of, you know, I'd have a post and it'd be doing really well or so I thought on Facebook. And it'd be a case of, oh, yeah, I can, you know, possibly get some leads from this. So I'll, you know, I'll pay to get it out there and, yeah, mm. and wait two or three hundred pounds. <laughs> it's a tricky one though isn't it i think you know it's that whole kind of marketing thing of like i think you have to be exposed to a brand about eight times or something to actually make a purchase with them i think that's it, it might even have gone up in the world of noise or social media but i think yeah. you know sometimes a few social media ads on the top isn't so bad as like a, you know, a cherry on the top reminder but i think it's always going to be that natural organic great content community whatever that's the real strength that's driving value if you're selling a t-shirt, maybe Facebook ads is a great way of doing it because people will click, make a purchase straight away. The money's in the bank for something, I guess, when you're selling a service, it's very, very personable. So I guess people want to believe in you, the brand, and maybe almost do their due diligence before actually signing up to something like your services as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also, you know, the, the fitness industry is full of, full of bullshit, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know my opinion. No, no. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't have any opinion, but yeah. I mean, but I guess the, the thing is as well, it's like, you know, and there is so much exposure. You use Instagram, for an example. There is so much free stuff on there. There is so much like, you know, top 10 tips to get a healthy body or whatever. It's like, it really does feel like overkill, though, doesn't it, on a lot of these channels? So I guess you kind of have to do something different. And that's why, obviously, you've got such a vibrant community as well. Yeah, and you just touched then, you said top 10 tips to do blah, blah, blah. You just touched on the kind of um, the clickbait-ness of it all again. And I actually subscribed to a a fitness marketing monthly, which was like a trial thing from something called the uh, Personal Trainer Development Centre. And it was only a very short-lived thing. They designed it basically as an imprint newsletter that was delivered to your door. Um, I think it ran about two years ago. And the subscription was quite expensive, like £30, £40 a month for a couple of pieces of A4, basically. 
But right. they'd have an interview with someone in the industry who was doing very well, and they'd get insight into it, and it's stuff you wouldn't get anywhere anywhere else. So some of that was how to write that content, you know, copywriting, basically. Mm. And it, those kind of things, like, you know, the five things I wish I knew before I started doing push-ups, yeah. you're going to click that. I don't care who you are, you're going to click it because you're yeah. like, I don't want to make these mistakes. I don't want to make these mistakes. So they know exactly how to hijack your brain. And even if you, you know, even if you're trying to kind of function executively and think, I'm not falling for this crap, you'll, you'll probably click on it, even yeah. if you only watch 15 minutes of it. And then they've, they've probably got you. Do you know what I mean? So I learned about how to write that copy. But that, a lot of that doesn't feel genuine to me. It's not, yeah. it's not me. Do you know what I mean? I guess you've got to have that balance, haven't you? You know, there's, if you put out the odd one of those, it's kind of great if it fits in with your overall strategy. But like you said, if it's just clickbaity stuff, then you just feel like an empty brand. You don't feel like a personable solo entrepreneur who people want to spend money with because it's making an impact in your life or your business or locally or whatever. Yeah. So then there's something we might call the elevator pitch. Mm. So how can you say something quite succinctly to target someone specifically? So it might be a case of, you know, uh, I'm, I'm looking for, you know, five, 35 to 45 year old men or, or, or fathers of, you know, young children or whatever to get even yeah. more specific, you know, who hate the gym, who have an unhealthy relationship with food, but, you know, want to want to live longer, feel better and all it perform better and be a better role model for the kids. And that succinctly says a specific type of person and narrows it down. And then what happens then is I've, I've usually got some insight into that person, and particularly because that person would be me. You and know it sounds I mean? like me as well, Roger. Do you know what I mean? so. <laughs> but then I will know kind of what works generally for that type of person, or, well, more specifically for that type of person, uh, either because I've lived it or I've trained people in that way mm. or coached people in that way. And then when I put an advert out like that, you see it and you think, he's talking to me. So, yeah. you know, I mean, and, and I am. Yeah, I mean, because I guess, you know, there's there's only so many different types of clients that you can have as well, or, or maybe that you can kind of potentially relate to as well. I guess you yeah. almost would get more specialized as you'd move on. This is something I've chatted with quite a few people for potential future guests who are going to be coming on this show and other entrepreneurs who have been. And it's, it's almost like once they've reached a certain stage of their business, they feel more confident to kind of work in more niche areas, you know, because they feel they can offer more value and obviously maybe offer more uh, detailed specific support to that kind of type of person as opposed to being completely broad and completely offering every single situation as well. And this kind of takes me on to this next point because, you know, I think what you're saying, you know, being a, you know, let's say like a movement fitness coach or a health coach, if you will do, I think it's very relevant to anybody who's listening to the show who might be a business coach, a life coach, anything, you know, anybody really who wants to develop relationships, but I'm interested in terms of the journey that you take your clients on, you know, how, you know, what kind of tips do you have in terms of keeping them motivated, you know, keep keeping them re-engaged? You know, how, how do you basically keep them going on that eight week journey and beyond, you know, just to kind of keep them at it? Well, obviously that, that, that can be tough. Um, the conversations, I guess, and what I guess I didn't price for originally when I got into this industry is that you, you, you price for exercise sessions, you price for meal plans and your time involved in those and you don't price for in between. And what I found is it's those conversations and that support that really make a difference. You know, I've had a woman who's in her, in her late thirties, she's a single mom and she's, I guess she's had um, kind of a, a so she's not had an eating disorder, but she's had disordered patterns of eating. She's had a relationship with food that isn't, doesn't serve her very well. Um, and a lot of it comes down to emotional problems. And I'm not qualified as a you know, psychologist. I'm not qualified in, in mental health or any of those things. Mm. But we can start to identify, you know, she might eat these things at certain times when she feels certain ways. She might have beliefs about herself where she feels like she's not worthy of taking care of. Um, or where she starts to get stressed and she just thinks, oh, I'll just eat whatever I want and, you know, I'll sit on the sofa, et cetera. Um, and we can identify those patterns of behaviour and then we can start to change those behaviours over time. But in terms of as a more broad kind of how, how we approach the journey, it would be, you know, the first point of contact, we discuss some kind of 
uh, we do, I, I give a brief overview of my services. So there'll be like a bottom tier where people just get access to all the resources through the app, uh, the meal plans, the workouts and everything, and the, the login and the uh, so food login, food diary, in, you know, it integrates yeah. to my fitness pal. And that'll be a bottom tier. Then there'll be like a middle tier where they, they, they maybe just have online coaching. And then a top tier where they do in-person and online. And then from there, they've got a rough idea of what service they need. And I've also given them a rough guide to the price rather than rather than spend my time going through a consultation for them to go, whoa, I'm not paying that. Yeah. Uh, and then we'll go, we'll, we'll schedule a consultation, which will usually be about 45 to 60 minutes, where we go over training history, medication, lifestyle, injuries, you know, goals, and all those kind of things. Mm. And, and then from there, a lot of people, a lot of people are happy to just kind of get started from there without too much kind of mindset work. The mindset work, you know, we, we, we want to get them doing stuff, taking action straight away, yeah. rather than give a load of worksheets to sit there and procrastinate with. <laughs> and then they drop out, I guess, anyway, if it seems to have too much hassle. So then the worksheets might come later on where we might do something like you. And you may have heard of these, like the five whys. So that would be to ask someone why five times. So a really basic example of this will be, say you get like an 18-year-old lad who's, you know, either skinny or, or, or overweight. And it's like, well, they, they, you know, they want to they want to put on some muscle and they want to, or they say they want to get ripped, something like that. And it's like, well, why? And they say, well, you know, because I want to impress women. And it's like, well, why is that important? You know, yeah. and it might be as simple as I want to get laid and it ends there. Yeah. But it might go, <laughs> it might be, it might be like, I want to, I want a family one day. You know, yeah. I want, I want that. So and you're going it, deeper into that sort of thing about where they need to get to eventually, but the five whys on the way. Yeah. So that's and that's their anchor then. And it's yeah. not lose weight and tone up was the surface reason, but then yeah. something deeper. Do you know what I mean? I want to be a good role model for my kids. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to die. Whatever it is, it's <laughs> those kind of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess you know, multi-layered, and I guess there's extra commitment then, like you said, to use the word anchor. It's something yeah. which keeps these people actually on track because it's better than just being, I guess, tier one. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, God, I don't want to use tears again. And we're still in these COVID times. You know what I mean? It's like there is that first primary reason, let's say. But then, like you said, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper, which hopefully should keep keep people focused on their on their ultimate goal in another day as well. Yeah. One of the other ones that I really like, which is, you know, it's freely available online, the, the heaven and hell exercise. So basically you would draw two columns, one heaven, one hell. Um, and you would take... You would, you would take the results of you not doing what you should do to the nth degree and then the results of what you what you should do, you know, to the nth degree. So basically, let's say I'm 300 pounds, you know, and I've, I've not eaten a vegetable for the past six months and, you know, I've not been off my sofa for the past six months, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm on a slippery slope to say, or I've already been diagnosed with, say, type 2 diabetes, you know, and, and given all these other health problems and I'm starting on various medications and it's like right well if I don't do what I know I should do mm -hmm. then I'm probably going to end up with a limb amputated a hand foot or leg or something like that you know if I've got say digestive disorders say I've got you know ulcerative colitis or something then yeah. the end result of that might be a colostomy bag yeah. and it's you know do I want to end up in a wheelchair you know pooing in a bag blah blah yeah. blah you know obviously it's not just that, it's my mental health is probably going to spiral downwards. Mm. I'm probably going to lack self-confidence. I'm probably not going to achieve very much. You know, and I'm, I'm not saying people in those conditions never achieve anything. I'm yeah. saying that the likely result of those things is that things spiral downwards. Yeah. It's kind of like failure begets failure, do you know what I mean? And So I almost look at that worst case scenarios and then <laughs> see how bad it could get. So it's time to start making changes now. Uh, yeah, and that's your hell column, basically. You take it to the ultimate extreme. And then your heaven column is, you know, if I take action now, well, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to feel better about that. I'm going to get off my medication. I'm going to have a better relationship with my partner. I'm going to have a better relationship with my kids. I'm, my mood's going to be better. My sleep's going to be better. I'm going to achieve more and earn more. You know, my self-confidence is going to, going to skyrocket. And you, you basically create this, you know, idyllic, like paradise, heaven on earth. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, you've got these kind of two bumpers then. 
that keep yeah. you in, in mind. You know what I mean? And it's like, I want to avoid this and I want to move towards that. Well, the five whys and heaven that's going in some of our top tips for entrepreneurs as well, the heaven and hell ones, because I think it's so true. And, and I just really yeah. want to kind of move on onto that, Roger, because actually one of the questions I wanted to ask as well, you know, to start the show, we said it was really exciting to have you here because a lot of entrepreneurs maybe are working too many hours or they're desk bound or whatever like that. I'm interested if, say, let's just say any entrepreneur, it doesn't have to be a sole entrepreneur, it could be somebody running a business, it could be somebody running a big team, a small team, whatever. If they have limited time, uh, and please don't come back with like, well, you've got to make time to great time. <laughs> but, you know, if, if they have limited time, like say, let's say 20 minutes a day, like 20 minutes a day, what kind of small changes do you think anybody could be making on a daily basis that would again add up to a you know a, you know a, a big win like over time you know just to make those initial steps? Yeah. So then, I mean, like you said, then don't come back at you with some kind of try. <laughs> the the best one for that is lack of time is lack of priority, and yeah. and if you say to someone, and I'm not you know I'll I'll move on from this, but if you get someone to um, to replace that when they say I don't have time and I, this isn't my my own work this is from I can't remember who but she said if you replace I don't have the time that it's not a priority suddenly things shift it's like your partner says can you help me with this project and you say sorry it's not a priority your kids say can you play baseball with me or whatever it is around us and you say sorry it's not a priority it's very different that is that you know what I mean yeah um, it is it, it changes your approach to it and it's like well you know what do I have, what am I making a priority here? Scrolling on Facebook, that's not really a priority. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Um, or, or watching a box set of whatever, that's not really a priority. Um, so I guess some of it, get get your priorities in order. You know, we all yeah. waste time, but try and minimise it, try and maximise you know, what you get from your time on the planet. Um, yeah. But then, you know, if you say someone's got, say, 20 minutes a day, uh, not that I've got anything against Joe Wicks, but probably don't do a Joe Wicks workout for 20 minutes. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably best off. Um, I mean, a walk in nature is a great one. Mm. Um, so, 20 minutes walking in nature is a great one. Um, some simple stretches you can do at your desk. You know, if, you, if you're desk bound for most of the day and getting out in nature is not, you know, not that much of an option. Some simple stretches at your desk. And then, when it comes to, say, exercise, it's going to be the what we call the big compound movements. So, that's some kind of like squat, some kind of deadlift, some kind of pull, and some kind of push. Yeah. Everything else is just an accessory to those. So, mm. you know, keep those in the, um, you know, if you struggle with core strength, add in some planks. You know, if you think an area is weak, add in something specifically for that. And then I guess as well with that 20 minutes, you know, learn how to prepare meals, maybe batch cook something so that you've got something ready. So then the easy option is the healthy option as well. Yeah, that's good advice. Because yeah. I guess, you know, you said, you know, the we all have to eat three times a day, say, on average. So actually, yeah. if you could make those small changes at the time you would be doing your food prep anyway, or even like you said, batch cook on a Sunday or something, make really great healthy food, but do prioritize that. I mean, I, I've noticed a big difference as I've started getting out for a walk. You know, I've been doing this maybe every four or, about four or five months now, getting out fairly early for like a 20 minute walk really yeah. just sets me up for the right day. You know, when, uh, you know, when the kids go back to school and I'll drop them off each morning, it's a nice time to have that walk and extend the walk but then maybe come back and do a bit of meditation and you feel really ready to go for the day as opposed to just kind of just like, Oh, I'll get out of bed, have breakfast and then get straight to work as well. Yeah. Yeah. And getting stuff done first thing is, is usually wise as well, because if it's a new habit that you're adding in there as well, mm. the day will be eaten up without your consent and you won't do the thing that you're trying to add into your yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. First of all, I've stuck with advice. And I think, you know, and that, again, great, all that's uh, all great advice. And I think probably in terms of what you, you you kind of have the right mindset in terms of what we're talking a lot here at Subkit and Go Solo, which is about building a sustainable business, which, which fits in around your lifestyle. Um, yeah. Obviously, I know, you, you know, you've got a daughter as well, which is great. Um, you know, you prioritize spending time with her, you know, like, in terms of that work-life balance, like how do you get it right? I mean, because I guess sometimes, especially in your industry, it kind of crosses over quite a lot as well. You know, people will come back and go, oh, I love running or I love doing exercise. Or this is kind of your your job as well. So what sort of stuff do you put in place to achieve a work-life balance? 
Yeah, I mean, what you said then, I love running. I guess, I guess a lot of my frame of reference also comes from, like, how am I going to feel about that decision that I made when I'm on my deathbed? Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? So let's say I do love running. If I'm always saying to my daughter, no, sorry, I can't play with you. I've got to get 10 mile running. It's like when I'm when I'm on my deathbed, am I going to be glad that I prioritised the 10-mile run rather than play with my daughter? Yeah. Probably not. Uh, and I'm not saying people shouldn't have athletic goals, but there are definite trade-offs with them. And, you know, you can, um, you can read through or watch through interviews with these people and they neglected a lot of the home life, do you know what I mean? And it, things were t- tough for the partner and the kids because they plowed so much into the say athletic performance or whatever or work um, I guess as well when work becomes unsustainable you know 80 hours a week or or less but you know working yeah. on favorable hours yeah yeah and I would say that you you kind of do yourself a bit of disservice and you kind of think that you're being more productive when really you're not you're just you're just being more busy a lot yeah. of the time you know what I mean and it's there's no quality there if you've not got the things you know like like the life and and the family and all that stuff or whatever it is that you, you know, you stick value in, you put yeah. value in. Um, and I guess it, it can be tough to try and balance it. I've definitely neglected the work, I'd say, over since the first lockdown. The work mm. has come down a little bit while I prioritise spending time with my daughter. And only over the past couple of weeks have we started to schedule some stuff, which has been tough. Where I'm getting worksheets and I'm doing bits of homeschooling with her. and Because we spend a lot of time outdoors. Yeah. Um, getting her to do some self-guided stuff, worksheets and things while I do work and just use, you've probably heard of a Pomodoro timer yep. which is 25 minutes so yeah. 25, yeah, 25 minutes you won't interrupt me, you'll leave me alone you do whatever you want and I'm going to do study 25 minutes and she did really well with it, she did, she did pop over trying to show me some photos from a photo album of us and stuff like that but she was like whispering in my ear you know <laughs> And then, well, she did really well with it. She did. And then I've also got, and I've been using this this app. You probably won't see it anyway on there, but I'm just going to find the, t- the name of it. Uh, save My Time. So right. save, my, save My Time is, a, is a, a tracking app for tracking how you spend your time. And you might have used stuff similar on Apple devices where yeah. it'll track you in screen time. Now, this tracks your time in the entire world. So basically, you enter it. So... I come up with the categories of things. I come up with the name of the activities, and then I have them on a kind of dashboardy thing here, which you'll see, uh, just to see yeah. how it's laid. You can't read them, obviously. But basically, I've got things like sleep, uh, working online, chores, fannying about on the internet, which is obviously <laughs> one of the things up, um, <laughs> having a minute, uh, thinking, uh, work admin, dreaming, planning, eating, playing guitar, being active, friends and family time, those kind of things. And then I've categorised them as well. So like the friends and family and the chores and the sleeping and all those go into the category of life. And then um, I've got the work category, which obviously has the online work, the in-person work, the admin work and all that stuff in there. And then every week I can look over my statistics and you can get a little... A little chart made out of it. There you go. Okay, cool. Very cool. I can, see, I can see how much sleep I had over a day, over a week, over a month, or over a year. Um, and I'm not saying you should obsessively use that every single day if you like, because I come off it for, for say weeks at a time. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's good to see how things slip when you don't. You know, you're not conscious. But it's a good use of technology for a purpose. Yeah. For instead of technology being a time thief or something, or just literally zapping you in. It's a way of you actually using technology for some positive outcome as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There was another another app which I used in tandem with it, which I don't use as much called Stay Focused, which actually yeah, I used to use that. Yeah, it's it's a really good one. It is, yeah. and you can have it so you can use Facebook for say five minutes a day, and when you click on Facebook, a timer comes up saying you've got five minutes, and that yeah. makes you be a bit more intentional and focused with the use. I used to have all of these as Chrome plugins and, you know, like they would shut down a website if you'd give yourself five minutes a day to look at it. And it was great. But then I was finding I was needing to use some stuff for work or whatever. And you'd be like, oh, no, I'm locked out now. I can't actually get access to it. So I think I had to roll them down and my computer was running super slow with all these. But I agree. And I think they're all good tips, Roger, because I think, you know, like, you know, we've got to get it right. You know, you've got you mentioned earlier on prioritizing stuff in life and 
you know, days turn into weeks and weeks turns into months and all of a sudden you're in bad habits and, and all of a sudden, you know, you wonder why you're doing it. So I think that's great advice that a lot of our other entrepreneurs will be able to take in. So you'd be pleased to know we're now coming on to our famous rapid fire round where we get to quiz you about some of your uh, favorite things in life or top tips. So again, uh, don't need to have loads of kind of, uh, you know, sauce on the burger, if you will do afterwards, but you know, like, I'm very interested to get your take on some of these questions. So let me ask you, who are some of your favorite entrepreneurs and why? Um, I guess t- Tim Ferriss was, was the kind of guy who got me into, you know, entrepreneurs, you know, the four hour work week and plowing through that. And there's a lot to digest in that. And I do come back to it every so often. And obviously things like stay focused and, and those kind of things were a lot his, I mean, he, he probably didn't really invent much new. He just collected a lot of data, didn't he, and put it all together. Yeah. Uh, but it was a lifestyle, yeah. like or a new philosophy for looking at life, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. And it, it was. I mean, he he basically distills, doesn't he? You yeah. know, and, and gets it out there. And he, yeah, he's done a really good job, and I do like him, and I still check in with him every now and again, kind of check it, check what he's up to. Um, so I guess he's one of the biggest ones. Gary Vaynerchuk, I checked out, and I occasionally like some of his stuff. He's not. Yeah, yeah I mean, you checked out Gary Vaynerchuk, haven't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, we know. I think f- the good thing about this show is I think Ferris is pretty much name-checked by everybody, which is great because I've been an advocate for many years. All the books are here as well. So and like you said, I pick up the four work, four hour work probably at least every 18 months and think, I need to get back to not reading so much news or whatever the tips are in there. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, and, and Gary V as well, like, you know, he gets picked up. But again, I think he's very chalk and cheese. But actually, every entrepreneur who's, who's mentioned Gary Vaynerchuk has actually said, uh, again, they like some of his stuff. But some of his stuff's a bit too intense, really, you know. Yeah, I think he comes across as, as very angry a lot of the time. And um, he can come across quite materialistic, which just isn't what, what I'm really about, I guess. Um, and I think that there's a danger of that with a lot of entrepreneurs that come across quite materialistic, like the patching holes in the in the life with material possessions. Yeah. Um, when you dig a little bit deeper with Gary Vaynerchuk, I find like a lot of it does come from a good place. And, mm. you know, he grew up very poor and he has been through his hardships. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but, you know, he likes some expensive things because he likes those expensive things. And that's that's fine. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. And who would you say is your most inspiring person in life? Um, that's a difficult one. <laughs> this can sometimes be a tearjerker as well on the show. So <laughs> I don't, I don't, I guess I haven't thought that one through too much. I guess, um, I guess, I guess I'm inspired by by people who can just who can change things around. Do you know what I mean? We've got yeah. grit, perseverance yeah. in general. So, you know, sometimes I'm inspired by my own clients yeah. in terms of like what they can do in the face of adversity. Wow. I, I can see that being a new, uh, you know, sound clip we're going to add to your website as well, like after this as well. So you'll have a 500% increase in, in signups o- overnight as well. But it's true, you know, I guess you're so, you know, you can see people's journey. You can see where they start and where they end up. Yeah, there is someone else who kind of, I check in on every now and again because he's a bit chalk and cheese is david goggins i'm guessing you've heard of him i don't know i'm the name does ring a bell but i'm gonna have to look into this afterwards he was a navy seal and he was like an air force something and he was some other kind of he's basically been at like the elite level within like three you know kind of like the navy the air force and something else basically yeah. no one else has ever done that the guy the guy runs ultra marathons hundreds of miles yeah. you know with, with fractured shins and uh, it's just <laughs> these and, guys uh, are crazy yeah he just screams in people's faces all the time and he, but he <laughs> with him it kind of comes from a good place and I, I um i listened to one of his audio books uh, or the, i think it's the only one and i think it's called can't hurt me um and basically the first chapter is just totally depressing and it, you know him being abused and just having an awful life where he lived and and really not having, you know, his needs met and anything provided for him. And then basically in the face of that adversity, it's a case of, well, I can just crumble and break and die or I can kind of face it and say nothing's going to break me and, you know, push himself to the extremes. Yeah. 
Well, this is why right. I, don't, I don't, I don't, I never put that one in the prep for our guests because I think sometimes you need to process it in real time to think of who's yeah. inspiring you know down there. So yeah. he's really good every so often to watch and think, you know, I'm, I'm bullshitting myself. You know, I'm not. Look at what he, he's like. He's trying to do 2,500 pull-ups in 24 hours. You know, the skin's peeled off his hands. You know, and he's having a bit of that. And then he fails miserably. And then he comes back and does it a few months later and fails again. Then he comes back and does it and, and wins. You know what I mean? He gets the world yeah. record. In- wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to check this guy out, actually. There goes my Friday evening anyway. And you want to check out, there's an interview with a, with a guy. Like, I'll, in fact, I'll send you the link later. But there's an interview with a guy who basically got David Goggins to live with him for 30 days as his personal trainer. <laughs> Basically, he says to him, I want you to live, when he meets him, I want you know to come and live with me for 30 days and be my personal trainer. And David Goggins says, well, basically, if you're insane enough to ask me that, then I'm insane enough to come and do it. Um, and yeah, he, he's, he, he talks about how um, he has him doing burpees on his, on his break in the office. And he's like, you know, he's, David Goggins is like, do 100 burpees. And he's like, but I've got to get some, he's like, do 100 burpees now, do it. <laughs> Uh, it's like you're not going back to work until you've done it. And he says, he says, you know, it was intense 30 days. He says, but when you walk into a meeting and you're dripping in sweat, your face is bright red, and you've got this intense character at the side of you. It's like you close every single deal. They're like, I don't care what you're selling, I'm buying it. I was going to say, yeah, I, I, and also, like, you know, I hope the guy looked like Schwarzenegger after 30 days or something like that. You know, I, he probably was run through the mill as well. Um. Yeah. If time was of no significance, Roger, like what would be the number one thing you think you could do over and over again in your business to make it grow? Um, I guess, I guess talking to people is really the, uh, the thing that makes it grow the most. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. You, Cause you can share it, you know, you can share these, I mean, you can share testimonials, and I, I guess I haven't been as great as I could have been at sharing testimonials. Particularly getting a client to do a video testimonial is particularly difficult, um, and that would, you know, a video testimonial would really get get clients through the door. I think because then you've got like the journey you mentioned before, you've got that, but in a video format, someone describing it in their own words. Yeah, you know, very saying, powerful. I, yeah, I used to struggle with such and such thing, and then I met Roger, and then I did this. And now I'm in this position and my life is so much better because of, do you know what I mean? And that's, yeah. that's kind of the ultimate, basically. Yeah. Video and testimonial. Guess, yeah. So video testimonials would probably be the number one thing if I could. And it's something that I've just not maybe invested enough time in. And it's also more challenging to get clients to do that kind of thing. Yeah. And tell us a funny anecdote about something that's happened to you in the world of business. Does anything come to mind? <laughs> in the world of business or in, in the sessions or... <laughs> remember this is a family show so I would say yeah I, mean, um, I guess it's it's not it's not the most amusing industry I guess uh, I mean the, during during sessions the, there are occasionally awkward things that you don't know how to react to mm. uh, and I've misread situations I had a client who fell off a, a one of the exercise balls, he was in his 60s, and it was, it was a basic exercise where you lift your legs, and he just yeah. kind of went, just back onto the floor, <laughs> hopefully not injured. Uh, and then there was a client who I kind of kind of misread the situation. He was in his 30s, you know, and when you're exercising quite vigorously, you can lose control of some bodily functions, you know, and he just he just let out a loud fart, basically. <laughs> but he was in a compromising position, and I totally misread it, and I laughed. And he wasn't the kind of guy who laughed at that kind oh, of thing. Oh, right. You got to shut it up straight away. Yeah. I guess that's it. You know, like even if even if you have put in the hours building those relationships, again, you've got to know how to deal with them in real time when something like that happens. Most people find it funny, but then you do get some who don't. So, yeah, definitely. Um, as an entrepreneur, what does success ultimately mean to you? Um, I guess a lot of my, my success will be. Um, I mean, broadly, would be having a balance between you know work and life and family and those kind of things and the things that, that I'm passionate about in my own life. Yeah. Um, but then, in terms of the business being a success, it would be you know changing people's lives. I guess is you know and and 
you know, it's probably cliche to try and change as many lives as possible. I would, I, it's, it's more like meaningful impact on those people that I do change. Yeah. You know, rather than, you know, I don't want to be someone who changes someone's habits for 12 weeks. I'll get some bikini ready or beach ready or whatever it is. I, I want to lead to a better quality of life for them and for the kids and improve yeah. people's relationships with their own bodies, with movement, with food, with all those kind of things. And I think that really shone through today, to be honest, in our chat. And obviously, you know, we've known each other for a long time now and also the different kind of the way you've set up your business. But I think it has really kind of shined through that. It's the, you know, obviously, you know, obviously not just doing this as like, um, you know, saint, if you will, do, you know, for free. But there's obviously something deeper meaning. There is that passion behind what you're doing. This isn't just a job to you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned, again, going back to the people who inspire me, there's a guy that, I guess I've heard his name before, but I've never really checked him out. And he was Jack Lalanne, um, yeah. or Lalanne. And he came up with the juicer, or one of the juicers, the Jack Lalanne power juicer. Yeah. And um, I think he was probably, um, what, 19, when was he born? I think he was probably born in like the 1920s, 1930s, something like that. But um, on his 70th birthday, he swam with 70 boats attached to him, with a person in each boat, so 70 people in 70 small boats. There's a video footage of it. Um, and at the end of this event, he gets onto the pier and does fingertip push ups as well. Um, but he was kind of, and I'm only just really digging into him because he's kind yeah. of one of the, you know, the old kind of greats in the physical culture world. But yeah. he was somebody who came on TV and was like, listen, you don't need to feel like shit. You don't need to, you know what I mean? He was like, you can have a good relationship with food. And when you read back through his history, um, I think he had, what was it now? He he had some kind of violent outburst where he, I think he attacked his brother with an axe or something. And then he tried, he set fire to his parents' house and other things. And this is in his like early years. And then at the age of 14, um, he went to some kind of nutrition convention. And basically he was told that his whole behavior and his life and his, you know, everything was basically down to the fact that he had crack. And then he yeah. just totally changed his life around and became this, like, you know, ultimate hero. <laughs> and also, you know, like, I keep talking as well to some of my personal stuff that I do about, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and that kind of self-actualization. And I think for a lot of people, it is that. It's kind of finding the reason why they were put on the planet and everything aligning in their life to, to reach that kind of reason why they're here. And I think once you find that point of reason for actually being here, whether it's an entrepreneur or a person, if it all comes together, then you kind of in that flow state, you can kind of do anything. And it's almost like when you have your biggest wins and biggest successes as well. Yeah. Yeah. But I am, uh, I've got some YouTubing to do tonight based on all the people that you've recommended here. But I think with you, that hierarchy of needs, it's difficult juggling all that stuff, isn't it? And I guess, yeah. Um, yeah, I guess what I'm doing is, is feeding exactly back into that because I always try and get the basics right. I always make sure I get outdoors every day. I always make sure I eat, you know, say at least five portions of veg, but usually 10 or more. Yeah. I eat protein all the time. Do you know what I mean? I try and get all those basics because I know that they affect my physiology. And if I don't have those those key ingredients, then I can't think myself better. Do you know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, like you said, you know, even if you just get the basics right, you've at least got the right platform and the foundation then to build on top of, you know, don't get the foundations right in anything in life. You haven't got anything to really excel there at the top as well. Yeah, I think it, when the first lockdown hit in, in the UK, I think if that had have happened 10 years ago in my life, I'd have been in a very, very bad place. You know what I mean? I wouldn't have realized that I was uh, last year when the, the first lockdown came. I think, you know, there were a lot of people who, you know, a lot of people took their own lives. A lot of people ended up with serious mental health problems. Um, and I think I would have probably, you know, fallen more towards that category than kind of the way I just, I withdrew a little bit from social media because I found that was good for my mental health. And then I went out and spent time in nature and did all the things that I know, you know, contribute to me being healthy. Yeah, it's so important. It's so important. So final question, Roger, you'd be pleased to know, but it's a, uh, for those people who are out there who are maybe thinking of taking the plunge and going solo, you know, what advice yeah. would you give to them if they were thinking about starting their own thing? Um, I guess think seriously about what you want to invest in it, how much time and energy you want to invest in it. Um, 
than what you preferred to do. But it's, it's never going to be easy. There's never an overnight success. Is that people plug away at these things for a long, long time. Um, yeah. But if, you, if you're seriously committed to it, then don't worry about say, you know, taking a side job where you can earn a little bit of money to help fund that. Um, but you do have to be prepared to do it for very little or no wage for a while. You have to, so you have to be passionate about it. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't become an entrepreneur or, or you know, set up my own business just based on the idea that I'm going to make money from it. I yeah. think that's just that's guaranteed to fail. That's great advice. I mean, you know, it's a cliche, but, you know, the money will come down the line if it's meant to come. You know, like you said, you're six years into it now and it's you know, you've built a really solid base and customer base, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, if it probably wasn't working after a few years, maybe then it was the time to think, well, I'm going to switch to some other idea and do that. I'm, I'm not saying maybe for you because you've got an extra kind of passion and reason for doing this, but people can maybe pivot a bit like your first business. You thought I wanted to move into something else. So I think like you said, you know, you've got to be prepared not to kind of like earn too much early on, but know that if you build the right foundations down the line, hopefully you'll make a living and then can grow the business from there. Yeah. And I realized, I remember realizing that the sound engineering, PA hire, recording bands, all that stuff wasn't my passion because I met someone through the sound engineering work I was doing in venues and he put me in touch with people who were putting on the music festivals in the UK and was looking to get me on the big stages there. Yeah. And then he got me some work on a TV show called the Johnny and Inel show in Manchester. And I did two weeks on a film set. Oh, well, a, a, a TV studio set. I did a, did a children's TV show. And, you know, my wage went from, well, when, you, when you're running practice rooms and bands are paying you £5 an hour for a room, you know, you, <laughs> you're struggling to eat. And then you turn up on this uh, TV show and they're like, right, how much do you charge for this? And I was like, well, I don't know. And then one of the other sound engineers was like, tell them 150 a day. And I was like, right, right. So I said 150 a day. And then, and you know, this is about, I don't know, what is this, like six or seven years ago? And then um, they said to me, oh, yeah, and then how much do you charge for the higher equipment as well on the set? And I'm like, all right, so on top of that as well. And then, you know, the, the food van outside is serving you... Um, Gourmet you know, food or something. Poached, poached salmon and steamed vegetables for, for your lunch. Wow. And you're like, you know, we call this kind of thing white glove work because you turn up and, you know, it's minimal work. You have people who help you load stuff in. Whereas I'm going to venues and getting paid 150 quid for eight hours in a night. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Taking all my equipment as well. and um, people are spilling beer on my equipment, and you know, you nearly get into fights and stuff. So it's the opposite. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. from that, I got a day's work on uh, Blue Peter as well, yeah. which again, you know, you're looking at say 300 pounds for two or three hours' work. Mm. But what I realized then is I turned up and do the Blue Peter thing, which was an American artist called Bridget Mendler. Mm. And I've got, um, at the time, I just split up with my daughter's mum. We just we just broken up, so my head wasn't in the right place. I yeah. turned up with some equipment that I'm not 100 percent familiar with. This is probably more, <laughs> this is probably more funny than the anecdotes I have before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> turn up, yeah, turn up there, not really knowing what I'm doing. Minimal sleep. I've taken a, a, a semi legal stimulant called modafinil to keep myself awake. <laughs> I'm totally anxious about it, and then as I'm trying to do all this stuff on a digital mixing desk, which I've never used before, yeah. um, they say, all right, here are uh, the Polydor and Disney record executives, speak to me. And um, in a minute, Peter Gabriel's sound engineer is going to come in and oversee what you're doing. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> you know what I mean? Where's the window to jump out of or something like that? Pretty much, yeah. And I'm like, this isn't, this isn't me. This is kind of, this is where I could go, the upper end of where I could go with this. And I don't feel comfortable. I feel like I have zero in common with these people around me and I'm totally stressed by it. So yeah. for me, it was one of the final nails in the coffin with that industry was like, I just, I don't want to reach the top. It's not for me. This is completely fine. And you know what? It's an amazing time to finish on that because actually, first off, yeah, we got our anecdote. The second <laughs> thing is that, you know, you're right. I mean, you know, this is what we're trying to encourage here with Subkit and Go Solo. It's kind of all about building that sustainable business that works for you. So it's not yeah. having to say, well, I want to make 10 million a year. It's saying, where's my whole balance in life? And, you know, what is it I'm actually trying to get? What's the main outcome that you want out of life? So it's only through those experiences that you just explained as to why, you know, why you realized it was time for a career change. So 
I think that I think that's a great great bit of advice. You said before, sorry to drag it on, but yeah, you said before, you know, do the do the whatever and the money will come. Yeah. There's actually a, a quote from Alan Watts, isn't there, which I'll totally ruin, which is basically <laughs> you know, he, he basically says, you know, be an artist. And he's like, you know, the only way you're gonna get the money from it is to just keep on being an artist, do the art, eventually yeah. you get better. Once you get better, you can command a higher fee for it. And then eventually that is your living, isn't it? Yeah. Well, that is going again in our kind of entrepreneur quote series. Well, Roger, so that will that that version of it will be going down in uh, carbonite or whatever for for many many. <laughs> <laughs> right, Roger. Final question is: Where can people find you online? So I've got my website at www.revolutionaryhealthfitness.co.uk. Yeah. Obviously, I've got a Facebook page, Revolutionary Health and Fitness, and then I've got the free group, which is Healthier Habits for Happier Humans, on Facebook. Brilliant. Um, yeah. Versus. Well, I've really enjoyed chatting with you today. I'm sure everybody's going to enjoy listening to this show as well. Uh, it only really leaves me to say thanks for joining us on the Go Solo show. And here's to a successful future ahead. Cheers, Roger. Cheers. See you. Cheers. Bye.